Hey everyone, welcome back to AshDev. Today we're starting a tutorial series on creating an arcade-style car controller in Unity. In this first part, we'll delve into the intricacies of suspension logic. Stick around till the end for some valuable insights. Let's get started and understand the approach of suspension first. Imagine we're shooting rays from each corner of the car, all pointing downwards. Now, if we apply a force to the car as a ray makes contact with the ground, it causes the car to bounce off the ground. And when the ray is no longer hitting the ground, the car starts to fall again. This cycle could keep the car bouncing endlessly. So, we need to fine tune the exact amount of force needed to maintain the car just above the surface, avoiding any unnecessary liftoff. I'll explain how we achieve this later in this video. Now let's start with our project. Create an empty object and name it car. Then add a 3D cube under it. This cube will serve as our temporary car body, which we'll replace with an actual car model later. Change its dimensions so that it can look like a car. Next, create another empty game object and name it ray points. Under this object, add four more empty game objects. These will mark the positions from which we'll project the rays. When positioning these, Ensure their placement is symmetrical for optimal balance and performance. Also, label them according to their positions. Now, let's dive into the coding part. Begin by creating a script named Car Controller. In this script, add a header called References. Beneath this, declare a rigid body named Car RB to represent the car's rigid body. Then, create an array of transforms named Ray Points. This is where we'll store all our ray points. Following that, define a layer mask called Drivable. This layer mask will help us specify on which surfaces the car can drive, ensuring the car won't accidentally climb onto things like walls or other undesired objects. Next up, add a new header titled Suspension Settings. Under this, introduce four float variables, spring stiffness, rest length, spring travel, and wheel radius. Now in the start function, get the car RB. Let's break down what each of these variables mean. Rest length is the standard length of our theoretical spring when it's not being compressed or stretched. Spring travel is the maximum distance our spring can either compress or extend from its normal position. We will use this to calculate the force to apply based on how much the spring has compressed or extended relative to this maximum travel distance. Spring stiffness represents the maximum force our spring can exert, which occurs when it's fully compressed. Now let's take on the suspension logic. Start by creating a function named suspension. Inside this function, declare a raycast hit variable named hit to hold data from the raycast hit point. Then, introduce another float variable named max length, which represents the maximum length of the spring calculated as the sum of rest length and spring travel. Next, wrap all these operations in a for each loop, since we need to execute them for each ray point. Thus, for each ray point in our ray points array, we'll apply the following logic. Use an if statement to shoot a ray cast from the ray point's position in downwards direction. Use out hit to store the ray's hit data. The ray's travel distance should be the max length of the spring plus the wheel radius ensuring the ray covers the entire length of our suspension components to be able to reach the ground. The ray cast will check against the drivable layer mask to determine valid surfaces. Now, let's create a float named current spring length to figure out how much the spring has contracted from its resting state. To do this, we'll subtract the wheel radius from the hit distance, which gives us the current length of the ray. When the spring is in its resting position, this calculation will be equal to the rest length, which we're using as the spring's length. Next, introduce another float named spring compression. This variable will hold the current compression of the spring so we can apply force accurately. It's calculated as the rest length of the spring minus the current spring length, showing how far the spring has moved from its rest position. Finally, we divide this by the spring travel to scale the compression ratio between 0 and 1, enabling us to understand the spring's compression in a normalized manner. Create a float to hold the spring force, calculated by multiplying the spring compression by the spring stiffness. 
This represents force required based on the spring compression. Next, apply this force to the car in an upward direction at the ray point by using add force at point. This action pushes the car upwards from the contact point, simulating a realistic suspension effect. To visualize our suspension system, we'll draw a ray from the ray point's position to the hit point's position in the downward direction of the ray point, using red color to indicate contact. If the ray isn't hitting anything, then we'll draw a ray from the ray point's position, extending down to the maximum length, plus the wheel radius, and we'll use green color for this. Lastly, ensure to call this suspension function within fixed update. Let's walk through an example to illustrate how this works. Suppose the spring stiffness is 100, rest length is 1 meter, spring travel is 0.5 meters, and the wheel radius is 0.33 meters, making the maximum ray length 1.33 meters. Imagine something 0.25 meters high gets under the tire, so the ray now hits this object. Now the ray length becomes 1.08 meters. According to our formula, the current spring length is the ray's length minus the wheel radius, resulting in 0.75 meters. Next, we calculate the current spring compression as the rest length of the spring minus the current spring length equaling 0.25 meters. Dividing this by the maximum spring travel of 0.5 meters gives us 0.5, indicating the spring is halfway compressed. Therefore, the spring force, calculated as spring compression multiplied by spring stiffness, equals 50, meaning 50% of the total spring force will be applied to the car body. Now, let's move to the editor and see our car's suspension in action. First, we'll set the variables, attach a rigid body to the car, and set its mass to around 1,000 kilograms to mimic real-world values, and then create a layer, drivable, and apply it to the ground plane. And in Car Controller, set the drivable layer mask to drivable. Then set spring stiffness to 30,000, rest length to 1, spring travel to 0.5, and lastly, wheel radius to 0.33. Now, if we play the game, the car is bouncing endlessly. To eliminate this issue, we will introduce a concept known as damping. In real world, a damper is essentially fluid within the suspension system that limits its movement. When the spring attempts to move, the presence of the viscous fluid restricts its movement, allowing the spring to return to its resting position more swiftly. However, the viscosity or density of the damper fluid must be precisely chosen. There's a specific formula to determine the ideal damper stiffness. For optimal suspension performance, Zeta's value should fall between 0.2 to 1. Now, to incorporate damping into our car controller, we'll create a float named damper stiffness. You can think of this as representing the density of the damper fluid. Now within the suspension function, introduce a float named spring velocity. This variable will capture the spring's speed, enabling us to calculate the necessary damping force. Just like real-life dampers restrict the movement of a spring, we apply a damping force based on the spring's velocity to counteract its motion. Spring velocity is determined by the car's velocity at that point in the upward direction. As the spring is attached to the car and moves with it, we are using the dot product to calculate this because it provides velocity in a specific axis and we need the spring's velocity in the upward direction. Next, create a float named damp force. This will be calculated as the spring velocity multiplied by the damper stiffness. The higher the spring velocity, the greater the damp force required to counteract and slow down the spring's motion. Then, introduce another float called net force. This represents the total force to be applied to the car after incorporating damping and is simply the spring force minus the damp force. This is because a higher spring force, which contributes to greater spring velocity, requires adjustment. Now use this net force in place of the original spring force to apply to the car. In the editor, we'll set the damping stiffness using the formula. To calculate the damper stiffness, we'll adjust the formula by moving the denominator to the other side along with zeta. Starting with the minimum zeta value of 0.2, we obtain a value of 2190. And for the maximum zeta value of 1, we get a damper stiffness of 10954.
This gives us a range within which we can experiment with different values to find the desired damper stiffness. Remember, the lower the damper stiffness, the more bouncy the car will be. I am setting damper stiffness to 3000. Now, as you can see, our car's suspension system is performing excellently. That concludes this episode. If you found this video helpful, consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to our channel. By doing so, you'll stay updated with our latest content. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.